What's going on, Ron? Man, I don't know, bro. <laughs> just, I mean, I, like, we want to be helpful, right? We want to be helpful. We want to be educational, informational. So it's an opportunity to be able to share a little bit about we what we know and just what we know about bowling ball. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What was your what was your initial thought when you when you saw this? It wasn't it didn't surprise me. Um, just kind of how, you know, based on what I know about bowling ball making and that kind of stuff. But it, it definitely hurts. Like it's disappointing. Um, nobody wins in this situation. Nobody ever wins when you have these kind of things happen. So, you know, I, you know, it's a kind of a sad day for bowling, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it started with a USBC article. And then actually today when we're recording this, um, the PBA launched another article. We'll get into both of those. And we'll also um, take a little bit of a dive um, into bowling ball making, what kind of goes into it. And also we'll answer some questions um, towards the end of the video. Uh, so we'll jump right in with the USPC article. This was, of course, launched yesterday on March 29th. Uh, article reads, USPC and Storm Products announce agreement of national tournament exclusion and ball exchange program. So, Ron, you want to go ahead and get us into the article? Sure, man. So, I mean, it says right there, right, that the USPC and Storm Products have agreed. So that means they had a conversation, they hashed out all the issues, and they've come to an agreement. Uh, on a national tournament exclusion rule and ball exchange program for six uh, storm manufacturer ball models. The agreement comes after USBC identified models having a percentage of balls produced below the USBC minimum 73D hardness specification. USBC's investigation showed a percentage of these balls, uh, bottles measured below the required hardness, and the six balls are listed there. We'll go ahead and show the six balls. So, storm phase four, storm. Electrify Solid, Storm Trend 2, 900 Global Altered Reality, 900 Global Wolverine, and Roto Grip UFO Alert. And effective today, which is actually March 30th, 2022, these balls, uh, ball models are prohibitive um, from use in USBC national tournaments, including but not limited to the Masters, the Open, uh, the Open Championships, uh, Women's Championships, all PBA, all W, all PWBA. Uh, tour events, USBC Junior Junior Gold, Youth Open Championships, USBC Intercollegiate Championships, USBC Team USA Trials, uh, you, basically anything that's a national tournament for USBC, right? But the models remained USBC approved for each competition. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, whether a tournament or league, uh, and they also have the option to adopt the USBC's national tournament rule prohibiting these balls. So basically what that's saying, right, is that um, for the national events, the USBC, they're out. And then each league or tournament can opt to follow that or not. Uh, USBC has shared uh, this national rule with Storm and Storm is, and has Storm support. So Storm is saying, OK, agree to this. Um, they're going to have an exchange program later this week. Um, USBC thanks Storm for collaboration. And then Storm says, you know, we're going to. You know, we appreciate USBC working with us. It keeps scrolling down. I'm kind of scrolling through, going through it a little bit fast. But if you want to read all of it, you can read all of it. But, but basically, USBC and Storm have come to an agreement. And this is what the agreement says. So that's where we're at now. Yeah, I mean, I think um, just seeing this article originally, it was, whoa, like six, six balls is a lot. Um, but I think the important thing to note here. Um, and something that I had been seeing um, over Facebook, whatever it might be, um, it's important to note that these balls are still good to use in league and in tournaments unless the league or tournament adopts the rule. Um, that is super important to note. Like these, these balls are still good to use um, unless otherwise noted. Um, yeah, that was by far the biggest thing that I saw. You know, there's one other thing. Scroll down a little bit, please, Dustin. There's one other thing that is kind of interesting. I think we have to go to there's, – there's something in here where they had mentioned that – oh, there it is right here. USBC has concluded its investigation 
and will not be taking action on additional balls related to this production issue. So that was that's kind of important. I, I didn't want to skip over that spot because what they're because what they're saying is is we're not going to do we're not going to have this investigation with any more balls. Because I saw a lot of people saying, "Hey, well, what's going to be next?" Well, they're basically telling you that the investigation is over here, so they're done looking at the balls. Yep. Uh, you want to jump into the PBA article? Why not? Let's do it. All right. Give me one second. All right. So this was announced today um, from the PBA uh, with goes on to read with regards to the USPC decision to ban the select bowling balls from different levels of certified competition. There may be some confusion over what equipment is allowed in the PBA. The following is intended to clarify the situation relative to the PBA. Um, it says, uh, to review Tuesday's uh, USBC announcement, uh, we just read that. We'll go on to say all six of these bowling balls remain allowed in all PBA competition through the remainder of the 2022 PBA season. The PBA has no data or indication that those USBC certified bowling balls would fail field tests. Again, the six aforementioned bowling balls are allowed in PBA conducted competition, including the upcoming PBA playoffs, PBA tour finals, PBA 50 national tour, and PBA regional tour events. The timing of USBC's ruling during the USBC Masters prompted the PBA to grant its members complimentary drillings on the uh, player services trailer for bowling balls replacing the newly prohibited, prohibited equipment. While the USBC Masters is a PBA Tour Major Championship, the event is conducted by USBC under USBC rules. So I think going into this, um, so another thing that I saw just on Facebook today was um, a lot of people were really looking into this remainder of the 2022 season, as in they don't know if it's going to be good after that. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think you got to wait, right? I mean, yeah. basically, the, the PBA, everybody kind of assumes that the PBA and the USBC do the same thing, but they don't. They're two completely separate organizations, right? So the PBA has their set of rules, and the USBC has their set of rules, and sometimes they overlap, but they don't have to. And this is the PBA saying that these rules don't overlap for us. So I don't know that that's a good or bad thing. It's just a thing, and I don't necessarily know that, you know, that, that, you know, it should be a big uproar, right? They can make their own rules. It's their organization to run and do what they feel is best for their members. So the PBA is doing what they feel is best and the USBC is doing what they feel is best too. So it's okay. Yep. Yep. So that's just a little article that this, uh, both of these articles will be in the description um, under a link. So you can go to the description and be the first thing that you see. Uh, if you want to read both of these articles <clears throat> in more detail or read them again. Um, what do you want to get into next? Well, let's do the questions. I know we we actually, if you're a member of Team CTD, you you have a little bit more inside information about this topic. So we actually asked them to ask us some questions. Dustin, you've got those questions kind of you know put together. So let's go over a few of those and, and try to answer some questions. Obviously, you know, the CTD, we're not we're not affiliated with Storm, we're not affiliated with USBC, we're independent. Um, but uh, you know, I used to work at a bull manufacturer, so I have some experience about cover stocks and chemistry and, you know, that, those kind of things. So we can hopefully answer a couple of questions just kind of based on uh, some general knowledge. Yeah. All right. So the first question we have, um, what makes these six different from the Spectre? Why was the Spectre full band or fully banned and these allowed at levels below national events? I mean, you know, the, the simple answer there is, is based on the data that said there, they have an agreement. That's the difference. Right. USBC and Storm came to an agreement with these specific six balls that was different than what was happening with Spectre. So that's that's why that's why they're different. Like that's why the six balls fall under this kind of category and Spectre falls under Spectre has been revoked, which means you can't use it at all, period. But these balls are only um, not to be used in national events um, currently. Uh, why does it seem that SPI is only is the only company being targeted? Purple Hammer aside, um, is the USBC doing these tests on other brand families, and we just don't see it because they are all passing 
If so, they should probably make that clear to the public so it doesn't feel like a witch hunt. Well, you gotta you gotta look at all the data here, right? Um, first off, it's not to USBC's advantage to to cherry pick or witch hunt anybody, right? Second, to USBC's credit, at this point, USBC is knocked pretty much everybody except for Brunswick, right? They did EBI at one point in time, they did motive at one point in time, and now they've done storm. So I don't think I don't think um, there's any data that would suggest that USPC is witch hunting Storm or was witch hunting Purple Hammer either. I think they're doing their job and the best of their ability. And what they found just happened to be that there's a bunch of Storm balls that weren't following the rules. So I don't think there is a witch hunt at all. I think um, they are they're, they're doing the best they can with what they got. And I think this next question is one that I've seen asked the most um, throughout our conversations in the staff group, um, as well as when people are sharing their posts on Facebook. Uh, why would they be approved initially by the USBC and then no longer be within spec well after production? Is this a curing issue um, or is there something vastly different in the manufacturing process from the ball submitted for testing versus the ones distributed after approval? So there's a lot of reasons for that. Now, I don't specifically know the exact reason because I'm not privy to that information. But what I can tell you is this. There are several different things that can happen, right, that could create bowling balls that are out of spec. Um, you know, we always like to make the assumption that all the bowling balls are made the exact same and they are the exact same. But the truth of the matter is they're not. There's this thing called process variation, and that's just inherent with anything that you do. And the more you make, the more opportunity you have for variation. And variation can come in lots of ways. It could be temperature. You know, you could have make bowling balls when they're and when it's hot outside versus when it's cold outside, and that could impact hardness. Um, you know, one of the other things that's kind of interesting that I, that I kind of found out about. You know, when you look at or look at some of the data, do you actually have um, the information from Storm's website regarding those six balls specifically? If you can, just go ahead and pull that up while I'm, while while we're talking here, but. There's lots of ways that bowling balls um, can can change. You know, when you are a manufacturer and you send bowling balls to the governing body to approve, you've checked those bowling balls. So you know that those bowling balls are good or else why would you be sending to them? But that doesn't mean that every single bowling ball you make is going to be just like those bowling balls because of process variation. Now, the thing I want to show you here that I thought was kind of interesting right off the rip is when you look at these bowling balls, phase four, trend two, electrify solid, UFO alert, Storm is telling you, based on their information, that there is variation in these bowling balls, right? The durometer readings, according to them, this is from their website, is between 73 and 75. Now, whether that whether that is coming directly from the ball or from the durometer, we don't know. But nonetheless, it's saying there's a variation here. The bigger problem that I see with this is, I mean, you look at the last two balls, Wolverine and Ultra Reality, now it's 74 to 76. But the biggest problem that I see with this is the limit is 73. It used to be 72, right? But now it's 73. So by default, if the if the if the limit moved up one point and you're not changing your formulas or your cover stocks or whatever to make them harder, you're you're asking to be on the limit, right? I mean, if the limit is 73, you're saying it varies between 73 and 75. How do you know you don't get a 72 in there? How do you know you don't get a 71 in there? Right? Like, that's kind of the logic that I would immediately apply to this situation and go, well, the first thing is you don't want to make bowling balls down that low anymore. The other bad part to this deal is R2S. R2S is a cover stock that Storm has used forever. That's the cover stock that's on high road, right? So if you've been making high road for... I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years. I mean, it's a long time, you know, and it was 73 to 75. You know, are you going to change that cover stock now? I mean, are you? And when you were making that R2S cover stock for high road for this long period, because you're laughing because you're getting it. But if, you, if you're going to change that cover stock, you know, now, is it going to roll the same? You see what I'm saying? Like, like it's not a good situation, bro. Like it just isn't. When you start really starting to look at it from a from a cover stock standpoint, and I, I can tell you just from from how to make a bowling ball, when you want to go from one type of cover stock to another type of cover stock, or you want to increase, there is a 
linear way to increase hardness. Um, it's called uh, uh, changing the index of the of the chicals. And basically the way the best way to look at that is is you have uh, four different chemicals. I'm making this up, but you have four different chemicals and you mix them together in certain amounts. And what you find is that you're going to get a specific type of hardness or bowling ball out of that. You can begin to play with the types of chemicals, the types of amounts that you're putting in the bowl and change what's called the index. And as you do that, you can you can predict hardness. You can make it go harder. You can make it go softer. The bad part of that is when you do that, you can make bowling balls that perform amazing and bowling balls that are lawn darts. Do you have the, uh, the we'll come back to this, this picture, but do you have the, uh, the, uh, the two balls that I sent you? Awesome. Sure. So let me give you a, a better example of that. Cause, cause I was part of um, kind of learning, learning a little bit more about index and why that matters uh, with a couple of balls. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you, I'm going to shove Dustin pull up. Which one do you, which uh, picture do you want first? So we'll start with both balls. Show both balls. And our whole point here, like I said, I'm not saying that this is what happened this time because I don't know. But what I do know is how to make bowling balls, and I do know why these kind of things can't happen. So both of these balls are eruption pros, or they appear to be eruption pros. And both those balls look fairly similar, but they're not the same. So, Dustin, why don't you pull up uh, – pull up? Uh, it doesn't matter. Pick one of the two balls. Because what we did was we actually got a little we, – we pulled the durometer out, and we wanted to test the durometer on them. So this is one of the balls that we tested. And if you can do the second photo of that ball, we'll be able to zoom in and see what the hardness was. I think that one looks like it's 75. I didn't take a zoomed in photo, so. Yep. So this one wrecks at 75, okay? And I want you to pull up the other one now. This one, this is the other ball. And we'll pull up the zoomed in photo of that one. And this one, yeah, this one rests at 74. So there's a one point difference between these two balls. One of them is 75D, one of them is 74D. And what I can tell you is, is the 74D ball rolled like you would expect, a typical standard normal reactive ball. The 75D ball was literally, literally a lawn dart. Like, I may drill them up just to just to show you guys, just to show you this. Um, those balls have been sitting in my office forever because there's a whole bunch of other things that we use to teach with at our classes. But I may do that just so you can see it. But that ball, the 75, is a lawn dart. And it's a lawn dart because what happened was there was a chemical change that was not known. And when it happened, it allowed – it unfortunately made the ball a little harder. But the other side effect of that – was the ball literally went dead straight. Like it went 100 feet, 100, 150 feet dead straight if the lane was long enough. So my whole point to that is these balls look the same, but they don't perform the same. And that is one of the things that I, I am curious to see how it's addressed long-term because now we know for a fact that Storm's going to have to make some changes to their cover stock formulations. And I know just from knowing enough about the bowling ball chemistry that, you know, small changes in formulations can make big difference in performance. So what I'm very, very curious to find out and see is how the bowling balls roll once they get um, the, their hardness up and they figure out how they're going to formulate their bowling balls again. That to me is going to be a very crucial component of this whole equation. I, I agree. I think um, I think it's going to take I, I could be wrong. I think it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but in terms of, I don't know if you can go in more detail about this, but when you were at the bowling ball company and the cover stock changed for this ball, the eruption pro, how long did that process take to, you know, change that formulation? Well, so luckily where, where I was at the ability to be able to, to change cover stock was, was able to happen pretty quickly. Um, we had a nice team of chemists that could figure out, you know, well, it's it's a linear progression. So if this does that, then we can do this and fix that. So it, that was a good thing um, from that standpoint. But I'm telling you, like, it, this equate this problem is a lot bigger than I think than what it appears to be on the surface. Just because you are going to have to change how you make bowling balls, and when you start messing with 
durometer readings and trying to make bowling bars harder, you can create some very, very interesting uh, reactions. And you look, you know, the cover stock names that are mentioned here, they're all different names. I don't know if that means those balls truly are different cover stocks or they're the same cover stock. I don't know that. Um, based on what they're saying here, they're all different. But what we do know is that these balls were all identified as bowling balls that did not pass USB-C specification for hardness. And four of those six that are listed there um, are mentioned that they that their range is on is the minimum is at the limit. So, you know, I, I don't I feel really bad for Storm, um, honestly, because, you know, they've got now this unbelievable amount of work to do in a market that's that's not in a good position. There's a whole lot of other mitigating factors that are working against them right now. Um, you know, supply chain is still really messed up really bad. Raw materials prices are going through the roof. Um, so I really feel kind of bad for them. Um, I also feel really bad for USB-C. USB-C is getting beat up pretty aggressively over this whole situation, like it's their fault. It's not their fault. It's their job. Like their job is to go, you know, check bowling balls and make sure that um, the manufacturers are following the rules. And, you know, it's just it's just bad all the way around. And then it creates it's bad for bowling because this is the topic that everybody is discussing. This is what everybody's focusing on. And, you know, there's not a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of light being shed on the topic. And, you know, for us at CTD, that was that was kind of the thing was like, well, we can kind of help kind of help explain some things. We don't know what's going on between Storm and USB-C, but we do know how to make bowling balls. We do know what it takes to make a bowling ball. And we do understand how you can make a bowling ball today. And then six months from now, all of a sudden you have a problem. You know, you know, I, I don't know if this plays into it or not, but I mean, when you look at the supply chain issues, you know, that could be an issue here. That could be a potential reason for uh, the, this issue. Could be a processing issue. Um, I can tell you how you process bowling balls matters too. Um, there are situations that that uh, manufacturers have to go through um, that can create um, bowling balls that are more variable, more different, in this case, softer. So, you know, I don't know that, I don't think that anybody, you know, purposely, um, you know, would, 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 is doing these things. I don't know. Um, but Obviously, uh, USB-C's job is to check and recheck and make sure everything is level. And when they find that there's a problem, they've got to say something. Yeah, I'm, I kind of want to go back to what the original question was when we pulled up the, um, the ball information. Um, do you think when the balls were submitted for approval, obviously they were good because they were approved, but now since they're mass producing them, is that the issue or is it, you know, chemical issue? Well, I mean, I think the balls that were approved, they were good. And everybody knew they were good. Storm knew they were good and USB-C knew they were good. When those balls went to mass produ mass production, which some of those balls, go back to the list again. Because some of those balls, I think like the, the altered reality, I think – It's possible we need to look at the we need to look at the the date that ball came out. But you also got to remember here's the other thing that's kind of that's kind of hidden in all of this, right? There was a specification change, right? So the specification used to be 72 was the limit. So there was a change from 72 to 73. But to specifically address the question, I think you know initially the balls were okay, but when these balls got to mass production, something happened, something changed. When did that ball come out? December 10th. So, so December 10th, 2021. So yeah, I mean, they're not, I mean, none of them, none of them are that old then, I guess. So yeah, I, I mean, there's, something there's, that's there's some balls that are over a year old or almost a year old, I should say. Oh um, yeah. UFO alert. Right. Yeah. Well, that's July, July of 2021. So that ball's old, right? I believe that is the oldest one. Wolverine came out. Yeah. Wolverine's fairly new. That's fairly new. That's the only – so Storm would be the only – oops. Yeah, I mean, Spectre wasn't – wasn't, and, I, you know, that's, that's a whole other issue too. Like, you know, specifically – yeah, what about Trend 2? When did that ball come out? Uh, oh. right. I'm trying to find Electrify Solid, but I couldn't find it. Oh, that's um, a good one to look too, so yeah. October. October. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know – it's not hard to do. You can have things happen in your process that you know or that you don't know that can create these changes. You know, for Motive, that happened too, right? So for Motive, when they made the balls initially, the balls were fine. 
But then as they kept making them, um, they had issues with the with the core manufacturing process and that ultimately got them out of spec. So yeah, I was, I was October as well. So, so these things can happen. And I don't, I think everybody kind of throws blame at USB-C. Like, well, how did you let it go for this long? Well, it didn't, they, let it, they didn't let anything go for this long. You know, the manufacturing process and or the chemicals changed from when they initially got them. And that's why, you know, that's why they're here is to just to check those things. And then when they find that there's things wrong, they got to get it fixed or at least get it addressed. So, you know, this is kind of what they came up with. And, you know, this is kind of the, the world that we live in. You know, like I said, I, I kind of feel bad for everybody involved because there's not really a good answer, there's not really a good solution. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, that Storm can figure out how to get their hardness up without and, and minimize the impact on the performance of those balls. So you want to hit the rest of our questions here? Yeah, hey, go for it. Go for it. All right. Um, most of them have already been answered, but we can dive a little bit deeper. Um, all of the Storm family of balls that were banned are polished. Some of the SPI family of balls that aren't polished were, or excuse me, none of the SPI family of balls that aren't polished were affected. Does Storm have a problem with the polish they're using or the chemical reaction that softens the cover over time? So, I mean, we don't know. Like, we don't we don't know that because we don't have all the data. We don't have the data from USB-C regarding how soft they were. Um, I mean, and you can say, well, they're all polished. That's true. But also the majority of the balls they make are polished, right? Like, when you look at the Storm family of balls, the, they make more shiny balls and they make dull balls. So that could just be a function of that as well. I don't know, though. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the actual answer there. In the manufacturing process, what is the step that determines the hardness? How precise is that step? Um, that is how enough repeatability is there to be accurate? And, or excuse me, or is this just bad luck because of imprecise process or system, um, or is the system in the manufacturing process that easily fixed by adding more? Yeah, so it's, it's, that's several different questions there, but to kind of summarize it, I mean, basically, it is the chemical composition that makes up the hardness, right? That's ultimately what's responsible for the hardness, and you can change that. Um, in addition, like I said, though, they had there's been a rule change, right? So they've changed the rules from 72 to 73, so that has an impact. And if you did not, if Storm did not change their formulations when this rule change came into play, they let, unfortunately, left themselves vulnerable here. I mean... When you see 73 to 75 and the spec 73, you're screaming red flag. You know what I mean? That screams red flag. So I don't know um, from that standpoint, other than to say that this can happen, especially as you get closer to the line. I know, you know, if I was in manufacturing now, we'd be moving our line up. We'd be moving away from 73. When they told, when USB-C said, which they gave me some lead, right? They get some time. When USB said it was going to go up from 72 to 73, if I was in manufacturing, we'd be moving our our hardness up because you don't want to be on the line. Nobody wants to be on the line. And if you can't do that, then this is the, uh, this is a potential outcome and result of that decision. Yep. All right. Last one that I got. Um, do you think this hurts the storm brand? So many pro shops are affiliated with storm. How is this going to affect them? And can storm be in real trouble as a company? I mean, I think it impacts everybody. Does it affect Storm? Of course it impacts Storm. You know, it, it's a credibility hit to them, unfortunately. It's a credibility hit to bowling. Um, nobody's winning here. Um, I, I think, you know, the good thing about uh, bowling um, is bowling as an industry is pretty resilient. Um, I don't I don't think like this is going to like bankrupt Storm or anything like that. I'd be very surprised if this, if this did something like that, you know. Um, I do think that, you know, they're going to have to, earn that trust back, right? <clears throat> you know, it's very easy uh, to lose trust and takes a long time to earn it back. Um, and I think we're going to have some, I think we as an industry are going to suffer as a result of this too. We say, well, what does that mean? Well, there's already been issues getting bowling balls made. Like like bowling balls have been, we had a we had a, uh, a bowling ball that was back ordered. It's been back ordered for what, two or three months? I don't want to name the ball. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. But two or three months, bowling ball has been back ordered. We can't get them because they can't be made. Well, this only adds to that problem. Those specters that were in the field that are being returned, that are being replaced, that sucks some of the capacity of Storm away from being able to build new bowls, right? This situation is going to suck more capacity away from Storm to be able to replace these bowls, which 
and um, you're having um, manufacturing prices rise and material shortages all the way around. So I think this is bad for everybody. Like it, even if you if you're not a storm fan, you don't like storm. This is still bad. Like this is bad for you because this ultimately is going to create other problems down the road and or immediate. If we get into a bowling ball shortage of storm balls, that's bad. Um, if we get into a situation to where um, the performance changes of those storm balls, that's bad. You know, so none of this is is good. I do think that they're going to do whatever they can to be able to rectify and remedy it. I do like what they did with Spectre specifically. I think they kind of went and said, hey, we need to make this right. We're going to, you know, uh, help everybody that we can. We're going to give the consumer a new ball. We're going to give the pro shop a drilling credit. I mean, that's a big deal. Like to me, that was a that was a that was a pretty big step, and expensive. Like that's expensive for Storm to do that. So that you know, kudos to them to do that. We'll have to wait and see what they do with these six balls. You know, this is a little different situation because the balls aren't revoked, and that's a big thing that people get confused. Um, revoked means you can't use it anywhere. Banned means you can't use it anywhere. Th that's not what this is. This is exclusion. You can't use this in specific events. So it's not the same thing. And that's because USB-C and Storm talked and came to an agreement, and that's what they decided to go with. So we're we'll to see what Storm ends up deciding to do uh, from an exchange standpoint here. And um, I hope um, that, you know, if you're watching this video, that you try to take away some positives and you try to uh, try to build up bowling, right? It's really easy to try to bash on somebody or pick on somebody or throw funny, silly memes out there. But that doesn't really help the industry. It doesn't help bowling and doesn't really help you either. So, um, you know, if you love bowling and you like bowling, you need to kind of help promote and push and pro bowling, right? So you need to kind of focus on the positives the best you can because this situation is not good for anybody. And at the end of the day, um, we need Storm. We need USBC. We need these people uh, to be focused on trying to grow the sport um, as best they can. Yep, I agree. That's for sure. Um Again, those questions were all submitted by members of our staff. If you want to join our staff, ctdbowling.com, click on regional staff, sign up. Regional staff is free to join. Uh, get exclusive opportunities like this. Ask questions for a video. Uh, pretty cool opportunity. This will be up, obviously, on YouTube. Um, so we appreciate our staff giving us some questions to ask. Um, yeah, uh, we will have... Links to both articles in the description will be the first thing that you see. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about these, uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, we will put the image of the balls themselves uh, with the cover stocks and um, the cover stock type in the description as well. Do um, you have anything else you want to add before we sign off? No, I mean, I mean, um, you know, we'll keep keep trying to inform people as best we can with what we know as things kind of change. You know, this is kind of a very fluid situation. It seems like now, though, at least from the Storm and USB-C situation, that this situation now is going to be kind of concluded from the USB-C part. So, you know, the rest of it will kind of be handled by Storm. So, you know, obviously, as things begin to change, we'll keep an eye out for that. And if we need to do some more videos, we will. Yep. Hopefully this is helpful. Like the whole point of us doing this is to be helpful. We're trying to give you information that may not uh, otherwise be out there. If you learn something, let us know in the comments. We read all the comments. So if you learn something, let us know. Um, we appreciate it. if you like the video, subscribe to the channel. Lots of educational videos on the channel, over a thousand of them. Um, so we appreciate you tuning in.